Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. If we've not met before, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family research. Today, we are talking about the DNA strategies that the pros use. So, just as a reminder, before we get started, please subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. So, let's jump into this. As a reminder, there are two YouTube channels. There's Genealogy TV, where you are watching this episode, but there is also NC Ancestry for North Carolina researchers, and that also has a website. Uh, as a reminder, Genealogy TV is also on Facebook, so you can follow us there. Now we've all seen that commercial uh, with the guy who uh, dressed up with his lederhosen and thinks he's German. So I'm going to play that commercial for you now. Growing up, we were German. We danced in a German dance group. I wore lederhosen. When I first got on Ancestry, I was really surprised that I wasn't finding all of these Germans in my uh, tree. I decided to have my DNA tested through Ancestry DNA. The big surprise was we're, we're not German at all. 52% of my DNA comes from Scotland and Ireland. So I traded in my lederhosen for a kilt. Ancestry has many paths to discovering your story. It's Long story short, the DNA uh, strategies that the pros use does not have really have anything to do with uh, the ethnicity estimates. What he was talking about were the ethnicity estimates that Ancestry puts out there. And they've got some really good tools out there now. Um, but basically how this works is they've gone out and sampled a whole lot of people, thousands of people, in the various regions that are deeply rooted in that area. Uh, people that have deeply documented history in various regions. And so when we take a DNA test, we're comparing against that sample set of those who are uh, rooted in those areas. So when we get our ethnicity estimates back, it gives us a little bit more finer detail as to what is there. The reality is it really doesn't, it kind of gives us clues as to where to look, but that's a pretty big region. And so how is it that we narrow this down and really nail down our family history? So how do we make those connections uh, using DNA? We really use the uh, cousin connections. Now it's in the in the cousin matches where you're really going to find uh, the answer to a lot of your uh, questions. Now keep in mind these are not estimates. They're not like the ethnicity estimates, which the ethnicity estimates are just estimates. Um, and they will change over time, but these cousin matches are scientific fact. They, they are your cousins. And this is a bogus example that I'm showing you right now. This uh, actually came from Ancestry's training area. And uh, so we're going to, we're kind of going to study this example a little bit deeper using our strategy. Um, but the reality is when we are looking to make connections and figure out our family tree and we want to use DNA, we're looking at the cousin matches. And so um, what we want to do is, and, and it doesn't really matter if we're resolving missing persons, we're trying to figure out an adoption case, missing parents, solving crimes, whatever it is, we're looking at those cousin matches. And it's usually the fourth cousins or closer that we're looking at. In my personal opinion, I prefer to look at the second cousins or closer. Um, first of all, it's a whole lot less work. Let's just be frank. So how do we connect our cousins in that match list with us? So let's take a look at a quick background as a reminder. Um, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, uh, a man has a Y and, a, and an X and a uh, Women have two X's, so we're not going to get into a whole lot of science, but just hold that thought for a moment. So the ancestor tree, if we look at it this way, we've got your father and your mother, your grandparents and your uh, great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents. And if you'll notice, you've got four pairs or eight great-grandparents and 16 great-great-grandparents course it doubles with every generation. So if we look at the way the DNA works, you get 50% from your mother and 50% from your father, father, mother, and your grandparents. Therefore you have 
of your DNA in you from your grandparents. And that's a rough estimate. It's not an exact. You have to about 12.5% from your great-grandparents and about 6% from your great-great-grandparents. And if we look at this, if we figure that each generation is 25 to 30 years, we're looking at, in this view, about 100 to 125 years back. So you can go out there and get tested um, at the various companies. The only one that's actually not pictured here is Family Tree DNA, and they are a fine company. But there's a variety of choices. So when you get your test results back, you're looking at your cousin matches, okay? So using your second cousin matches as an example means that you have uh, great-grandparents in common with all of these four people. So if we're pretending that this is you for a moment, this is your cousin matches, with these four people you share, guaranteed, uh, great-grandparents with them, unless there is some other little factor in there, like there's half-siblings or something, but we're not going to get into that. It gets a little more complicated. But we're going to pretend for a moment that these are full second cousins, and therefore you would share uh, great-grandparents in common with those people. So if we take a look at that tree again, here's what that looks like. So that means those second cousins are sharing uh, great-grandparents with you, but which set? We got four sets of great-grandparents. So we got to figure that out. So if we erase the tree and we look at just the great-grandparents, and we start tracing back down to present day, then we start looking at all the children of our great-grandparents, and then we look at their spouses, and of course then they have children, and by the way the boys are represented in the blue dots and the triangles are the girls, and they have kids and so forth. Now. The blue lines represent, blue uh, arrows, by the way, represent each generation. I could not put all the little triangles and dots here uh, just because the example was getting too large for you to see. But they're there, okay? So along the way, when we start doing all this research and we start discovering all of these people, eventually what will happen is the second cousin match will reveal itself. And then you can discover, okay, now we know which set of great-grandparents that we have in common and how they trace back, okay? So, but wait a minute, what about if we have missing parents? For example, adoptees, foundlings, unknown fathers, whatever the situation may be, maybe you don't know who your parents are. Okay, let's take this uh, work uh, example here because this is where uh, the meat and potatoes of how the strategy works. So in this example, this is a new example, okay, here you are not knowing who your parents are and but you take a DNA test and you have a third cousin match and another third cousin match. You have a female third cousin and a male third cousin. All right, that much we know. So what we do is we start looking at their family trees. And that third cousin, and let's stop just right here for a second, this female third cousin, we look at her tree, she's got some documentation. The reality is her tree is going to have four sets of these great-great-grandparents, excuse me, eight sets of these great-great-grandparents up there because there's 16 great-great-grandparents. So. The reality is this tree is much bigger than what it looks, but for the simplicity's sake, uh, I am only showing these great-great-grandparents because it'll eventually lead to us. So I'm just, for the sake of being able to actually see it all on the screen, normally we would be researching their entire tree up and down. That is basically the strategy. So as we continue to research doing regular traditional genealogical research, good quality research, we start making the connections across this family cluster. Along the way, we've discovered that this male third cousin and this female third cousin are, in fact, in the same clan, 
And so we continue on with our research. Now, it could have been that these two third cousins were actually on opposite sides of the family and do not show up together in the same tree. In this example, they are. So we continue to do this research until we kind of figure out where we think we might fit in. Now, we're not sure at this point, but we suspect that this third child of this couple, this woman, might be the mother that we're seeking. Maybe this one. But right now, for what all the research that we've done, right place, right time, all of the details that we've collected, perhaps this is the person that we think might be the parent. Could be several people, so it might be we have to do the research of several people in order to figure it out. But this fits with the third cousin clan because if the third cousin is going to have, and I use, I use the, uh, a, the number of G's is how I remember how this works. So a third cousin is going to have one, two, three G's in common. Okay, so that's how I remember it. Second cousins are going to have a great grandparent or grandparents in common. Um, so that's how I remember it. Okay, so now we have the suspected mother and we move on and we take a little bit closer look because now we're kind of narrowing our focus. All right, so if we think that this woman could be the mother we seek, then we do some more research and we discover who her husband is. So now we might have suspected parents and we continue on with our research. And then we identify all of the cousins. Now at this point, what we need to do is we need to prove our case. We've, we've come to a hypothesis. We think that these folks in green here are the parents of the person we are are looking at okay so that means we need to look at all of the people around that area to prove our case so that would be our first cousins and our second cousins in that in that territory okay so what we do is we go out and we identify first and second cousins that a are that we can find Maybe some of these folks we can't find, or they have passed away, or they are unable to present information to us. We can't find them for whatever reason. So let's pretend that we've identified these six people, and we ask them to take a DNA test. So if we take a look, if we take a break from that thought for a moment, and we come over here to um, Blaine Bettinger's, uh, the genetic genealogist, um, has done some awesome work at figuring out how many centimorgans that we have in common with our various relationships in the family clusters. So for example, siblings share about 2,600 uh, centimorgans uh, with us. So, so my sisters, for example, um, are listed here. And I have one sister that is 27. 38 centimorgans from me and that falls within the range so the range is 2342 to 2917 and then my other sister is 2505 so she squarely falls within that range as well and so on ancestry this is kind of what it looks like and it falls into the immediate family bucket so if we look at first cousins first cousins average 884 or actually within this range okay and if we look at second cousins they average 232 with it with a range of 99 to 397 all right so if we go back to our example for a moment and we manage to get some of our uh, potential cousins to take a DNA test for us and we've offered to pay for those tests and 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 get those back and we see that one came in at 880 and one came in at 915. And we look, well, sure enough, that chart showed us that the range was 619 to 1159. So sure enough, they are confirmed to be first cousins based on this relationship. The parents are up here. We've got child number one, child number two, and child number three 
who then married and had a child. So these, the fact that we've got a child from this person and a child from this person confirms both our first cousins, then the only logical solution is that, uh, that you are a child of this third couple. Now, in this case, we've got second cousins and uh, they also squarely fall within the range here. So that helps kind of seal the deal that there are no other possibilities. So we can cross out all of the other potential parents uh, along the way. Sometimes when we do these uh, experiments and we, we uh, do all this research, uh, we discover that there is a sibling and that falls uh, in the 2600 range. Remember, there's actually a range there. So just kind of to recap, we take those cousin DNA matches and we research using traditional genealogical techniques. And there's a lot of research there, so don't underestimate. I knew I kind of flew through this quickly for demonstration purposes. But then through that research and through uh, our cousin matches as part of our evidence, we can narrow our focus. We try and test closer relatives uh, if needed. Sometimes you'll get really close DNA matches to begin with and you won't have to test any further. And then we try to prove and disprove. And that's where I went back briefly and X'd out the people that it could not be. So you're trying to work just as hard to prove that you're wrong as you are that your hypothesis is right. So be careful not to have bias in trying to make the, the evidence fit. You want to be sure that you've made a proper connection. With DNA, my question for you is, what is the one burning question that you've always wanted to know about your family history? In order to answer that question, we kind of need to determine what the question is in order to decide what test is appropriate to take. So it kind of depends on what your question is. Really that one burning question, what is it? Well, maybe it's you don't know what your, who your grandfather is. And so you take and you identify what your problem is. Who is it that you're trying to find not trying to shotgun blast the entire family tree, but who is it that you're trying to discover? So as a reminder, autosomal DNA, we get 50% um, from each parent to child and thus 25% from each grandparent. So when you're doing autosomal DNA, you're kind of taking a shotgun blast at the entire family tree. Um, it, it kind of gives us DNA from all of our grandparents and as a reminder, as we go back, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it eventually gets to the point where the DNA is so tiny that it's not usable. And that's usually somewhere around the 200 year mark. If you're trying to figure out the father's line, then a Y DNA test might be appropriate because we get 100%, well men do, 100% of their Y DNA from father to son. The mitochondrial DNA test might be appropriate if you're tracing the mother's line, and that is a little bit different strategy for mitochondrial DNA, so I would suggest you study up on that before doing it. So the testing companies that uh, do these various tests, all of them do the autosomal DNA. That's Ancestry DNA, MyHeritage, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA. Family Tree DNA is the only one that does all the tests. And there are actually more companies out there, um, but these are kind of the big four. So uh, the curiosity is what's kind of driving the answer to which test you're gonna take. As a reminder, you can always upload to GEDmatch and capture more cousin matches. For example, if you tested on Ancestry and you're not finding what you need, you can upload your raw data. Basically, you go onto Ancestry and you download your raw data. It becomes a zip file. You don't want to unzip it. You just upload it to GEDmatch as it is. And uh, you can find cousin matches from other testing companies. So if uh, one of your cousins happened to test at, let's say, 23andMe or Family Tree DNA, and they uploaded to GEDmatch, but they didn't do a test at Ancestry, you might be able to capture uh, some new cousin matches there. Also know that we use DNA evidence only as lead finders and that it is used in conjunction with traditional evidence such as birth certificates, newspapers, and census records, etc. We've got a huge amount of data now that we can use uh, to help 
us filling our family trees and it's not just DNA. So I hope that was helpful. As a reminder, we have Genealogy TV and NC Ancestry. Please subscribe. If you like that, please make sure you uh, give us give us a big thumbs up and um, make sure you leave a comment below. I'd love to hear uh, where you're watching from. So that's the question of the day. Uh, leave a comment in the comment sections below and tell me where you're watching from. Thanks so much for watching Genealogy TV.